A tēnā koutou, e mihi mahana tēnē ki a koutou katoa, e tatsu mai ki tēnē huihuinga, ki a rātou huki te iwi tūturu te whenua nei, e mihi tēnē ki a rātou ki a koutou huki ngā kai kōrero, ngā kai rangahau, tēnē te mihi atu ki a koutou katoa. I was going to say, people are okay if I do the rest of my presentation in English? <laughs> uh, well, thank you for the, uh, the invitation to uh, speak this afternoon. I'll keep it uh, brief. I know uh, some people uh, uh, were pushed for time. We are Very good. I, I, uh, I thought I just wanted to start by saying when, um, when I was a very, very young uh, researcher, uh, the first presentation, overseas presentation I gave it might have been Canada, and, uh, and I prepared for it fairly well, put a lot of time and effort into it, and I was talking about uh, Māori health and Māori wellbeing and uh, Māori research, and I thought I'd done really well, and then at the end of the presentation I invited questions, and the hand went up, and I said, yes, what's the question? And they said, what's a Māori? <laughs> So I thought, <laughs> it was in Canada, but the question was from someone outside of Canada. So I thought I'd uh, give you a brief overview of uh, Māori in New Zealand before I get into my very uh, brief uh, presentation. Uh, we currently make up about 16% of the New Zealand population, about 4 million total in New Zealand. We make up about 673,000. About 16%. Fairly youthful, you probably wouldn't guess that looking at uh, me. Uh, but uh, half our population be below the age of uh, 23, and the other half above the age of 23. We're still an ageing population, uh, despite that, we're getting more and more people that are, uh, I guess, entering their 80s and 90s. And we're increasing both in terms of number and uh, percentage of the uh, total population, uh, which is, which is uh, very positive. And life expectancy for Māori males is 73, and Māori females 77. Uh, majority of our people live in uh, urban areas, a lot in Auckland, which isn't our capital, uh, but a third of the population, total population, live in one city, which is in the northern uh, part of the North Island of New Zealand. Change from the past, our people, probably uh, prior to the 1950s, were largely rural. Uh, but there's been a significant shift uh, into urban areas since the uh, uh, 1950s, predominantly. But we remain uh, fairly much tribal, so we have uh, strong links to our tribes. Uh, culturally and ethnically uh, diverse, um, there, there are many uh, Māori that uh, can speak the language, uh, they know their genealogy, uh, the customs and traditions. Uh, there are other Māori that uh, are less comfortable in cultural situations and settings, don't know the language, um, don't uh, engage in, in cultural activities, uh, but nevertheless remain a very, uh, have a very strong sense of being Māori, regardless of that. And we're also becoming uh, uh, more ethnically uh, diverse as well. And as others have uh, touched on, uh, disparities is an important uh, issue for us presently, and disparities in health exist, uh, and elsewhere, exist across a range of social, economic and health indices. So we do pour in uh, just about any uh, health indice, you can, uh, we're overrepresented in uh, many of the uh, poor health statistics. Though I might uh, like to point out here too that we're also overrepresented in our national sports teams. <laughs> And we're also overrepresented in the numbers that have won New Zealand Idol. <laughs> which, which my colleagues from New Zealand are keen to demonstrate this evening at the dinner. <laughs> now I won't, uh, like I said, I'm going to keep this fairly brief. I might give it, uh, just, uh, yeah, this wasn't the slide I was expecting. <laughs> but never mind. What we, sh uh, what we see here, in about, uh, about 1800, 
don't pay too much attention to the slide. Our population was about 200,000. Uh, uh, we don't know the actual population in 1800 because there wasn't a census at that time, so it's the best uh, guesstimate. Uh, there's a guy called uh, Captain Cook, people heard of him? Okay, enthusiastic response there. Uh, he, he, there, was a, there was a guy on the Endeavour with him, uh, which, which uh, people might remember, a guy by the name of Joseph Banks. Remember Joseph Banks? He provided a lot of the uh, early written descriptions of uh, uh, a lot of indigenous populations throughout the Pacific and, and elsewhere. He described Māori as a fit, in the, in, the, in the late 1700s, he described Māori as a fit, handsome, vibrant and superior race. Tall and handsome. When, <laughs> <laughs> things have changed. Um, and whenever I uh, make that uh, comment, my, my uh, well, actually one time my, uh, one of my elders said to me, he goes, you know, boy, this guy, that, that guy Banks you were talking about, I said, yeah. He goes, you know he was talking about our tribe. <laughs> and I said, yeah, he might be uncle, but you know, he was on a ship and our tribe's way, way inland. <laughs> and he said, uh, yeah, I know that, but you know they had telescopes, eh? <laughs> so that was his uh, reading of it. But uh, about 1800, uh, pre-colonisation, our, our population was described as being fairly uh, fit and, uh, and, uh, and healthy. Uh, but we see throughout the, the, the 1800s wasn't uh, very uh, good uh, for our people in terms of their health and the population plummeted throughout the, uh, the 1800s. And when a census was actually conducted in 1896, um, I think it was about 42,000. So two thirds of the population um, were gone in a couple of uh, generations. And I'm sure uh, it's uh, a statistic that's not unfamiliar to uh, many uh, people here. Uh, introduced diseases, um, cultural uh, decay, cultural change, uh, people being moved off their traditional lands, uh, poverty, um, and also there was a, a weapon of mass destruction that was introduced in the, uh, in the 1800s called the musket and uh, tribal, inter-tribal wars and, uh, and wars with the uh, colonists also caused a, a significant amount of um, uh, death and destruction within our population. Uh, so by the end of the 1900s, it was assumed that our, uh, our people would become, uh, uh, end of the 1800s, sorry, our people would become extinct within a couple of decades. It uh, didn't actually happen. And from about 1900 onwards, uh, the population increased uh, dramatically, uh, largely due to uh, public health uh, initiatives, health promotion, health education, uh, improved sanitation, nutrition, um, housing. And so the population increased dramatically in the 20th uh, century. Had, uh, and that, uh, that statistic, uh, that uh, graph uh, demonstrates that quite well. Uh, had uh, one of the highest uh, fertility rates in the world. I uh, won't give you any statistics on that, but I can uh, just as an example. But it was one of the uh, uh, largest recorded drops in fertility too. As an example of that, uh, my mother comes from a family of 12, uh, and I'm an only child. Uh, might be a number of reasons for that. <laughs> But anyway, uh, it, there's uh, actually more Māori now, and we're living longer than any other time in our history. It's a fairly positive uh, thing that uh, I think we should uh, celebrate. But it's not all, uh, all good. These are the major health challenges that uh, we would have liked, or we probably would have faced, or we did face in, the, in 1913. For the uh, epidemiologists out there, they'll tell you that's 100 years ago. <laughs> And in 2013, these are the main threats to Māori health. You can see a clear uh, pattern there. In terms of uh, some are less preventable in, in the past, uh, uh, less preventable than they are uh, today. Lifestyle, behavioural issues and other whole range of other uh, concerns are linked to that. 
Uh, as we've gotten older, of course, it's um, uh, caused other health problems to emerge, prostate cancers, um, increased morbidity from a range of other problems. DAT, I think that's dementia. I can't remember. Um, <laughs> dementia, Alzheimer's type. I'm glad uh, people uh, raised uh, uh, some of these issues uh, previously in terms of uh, improving health outcomes for Māori, where, where our health research focus uh, has been. Reducing uh, disparities has been a major area of interest um, over the past few years. Understanding the determinants of health, health promotion, health education, uh, improving access uh, to health services, as others have mentioned, is a uh, major issue. Um, understanding the role of culture is gaining traction, and there's now a general agreement that culture does play a role in improving health outcomes for our people, which may seem strange, but it, it was a, a challenge uh, 20 years ago, and we're focused on workforce development and improving uh, policy. So basically what I'm saying is that in terms of health priorities for our people, it's everything as I'm sure others can appreciate. Where is uh, further development uh, required in terms of health research? Probably, and this is just my own uh, opinion, I think we need more uh, quantitative uh, health research, and that's related to a workforce issue as well. More epidemiological and biostatistical research I think is important for our people. I'm not saying that qualitative, res uh, qualitative research isn't important, but I think if we have a balanced portfolio of research investments and activities, I think that can only be a good thing. Uh, health research, workforce uh, development, uh, others have touched on that, and it's certainly something that uh, we've, uh, and particularly the Health Research Council, have worked hard to address in terms of providing opportunities for um, uh, emerging researchers to develop a career in health research. There's greater investment uh, required, uh, notwithstanding, again, the fact that the Health Research Council has provided us with some excellent opportunities in the past. Uh, we still need uh, further investment. Uh, more of a translational focus. Um, and I guess what I'm talking about there is, is trying to identify what the outcomes of our investments are, research investments are, and how they fundamentally contribute to health gains. And uh, targeting uh, potential researchers. I think uh, uh, we need to identify researchers early. Um, I was going to touch on the point too that I think um, there is a need to, um, I was looking at some statistics from our um, university this morning, um, I think 70% of the uh, university population at our university, Māori, uh, are female, 30 male, um, and I, I guess that limits our um, opportunities uh, later, so I'm glad someone else brought up that uh, uh, that challenge we have. And I also think that, um, and this again, this is only my uh, personal opinion, that um, from the people that I know that are currently uh, health uh, researchers, their pathway into health research has been more, academ uh, more accidental than deliberate. Um, I'm just trying to think of a, an example. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of an example other than Clive. Um, actually, well, uh, what one of our friends, um, Dr. Mihi Ratima, who's a, is a, um, a well-regarded, well-known Māori health researcher, her first degree was in microbiology and genetics. And I remember asking her one time, I said, you know, why... Um, that's awesome you did that, uh, that qualification. How, how come you got into that? Was you know mentoring from your, your parents or instruction from your grandfather? And she said, no. She said, when I was at high school, uh, we have these um, university liaison people that go around schools and encourage people into universities. And she was sitting in class in her last year at school. And uh, this person was telling, telling the, the, the class about university and the opportunities there and this and that. And someone asked the question, yeah, okay, but how would you actually enrol? And the guy went up to the blackboard and he said, well, you know, I don't know. Well, say, for example, you wanted to do a 
degree in microbiology and genetics, this is what you would do. And she took the notes down. And it was purely by accident that she actually uh, embarked on that uh, career path. Uh, another uh, good friend of mine, he's Hawaiian, uh, Kiawe Kaholokula, who's now the chair of the Department of Native Hawaiian Health, uh, psychologist, outstanding researcher, and he got into the area because he was a courier driver, I think, and he was delivering some boxes to the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Hawaii, and he ran past this poster on, you know, posters on the wall? People advertising things, and one of the lecturers had put a notice up, are you Hawaiian? <laughs> Tick, and he goes, are you interested in psychology? And he thought, mm, maybe. And uh, he said, come to this room here. And it was purely by accident, he's now a professor of psychology, and if he had not walked past, if he hadn't been a courier driver and walked past that poster at that time, his career path would have gone down a completely uh, different, uh, gone in a completely different direction. <laughs> hey? It was just as well he went to psychology department, another one, another one. <laughs> uh, yep. Uh, from my own, uh, how I got to university, while well, we were on that uh, path, um, again at high school, uh, I got to university and got into uh, health research. Again at high school, walking past the principal's office, uh, one of my friends was outside. There were three of us walking past, and he was outside the principal's office. We told him to get the class, and he goes, no, I'm enrolling at university. And three of us kept walking, and he said, you should enrol too. He said, no, we don't do that. And he said, you get off the next period. <laughs> so we all spun around. <laughs> and uh, four months later, uh, there were four of us that went to university. Uh, if we hadn't walked past our friend at that time when he was standing out the uh, side of the principal's office and one of my mates, one of my friends, hadn't been smart enough to tell him to get to class, we could have probably taken a different uh, career path. Uh, one of them's general manager of Māori Health at County's Manukau DHB, Bernard. Uh, Nathan York, who's group manager at Tainui Group Holdings, property development uh, company. Another one's a judge, that's three of them. And I think I was the only disappointment out of the four. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess my main point there, and hopefully it's uh, one of the key messages from my, uh, my talk that adds to what others have said, because I think others have probably covered the majority of what I wanted to speak about, uh, is that in terms of health research, health research and development for indigenous populations, my gut feeling, and this isn't based on research, is that far too often it can be uh, left to, it, it can be an accident rather than anything that's uh, deliberate, uh, which is not always a bad thing, uh, but I think we could possibly have uh, a more robust and sustained health uh, uh, research workforce if we can be more active and deliberate in terms of creating pathways uh, for individuals that show promise. Because uh, I'm sure you can all um, appreciate this as well. There, there were people that I went to school with that had far more potential and intellect and ability than myself uh, that didn't walk past the principal's office when we did. And it's unfortunate to think what sort of contribution they could have made, uh, but possibly aren't uh, at this point in time. How much longer have I got? Okay, I can keep. Okay, I was going to keep going till five. Just quickly, uh, uh, one of the approaches that we've uh, developed, at least in New Zealand. Um, and again, the Health Research Council uh, sponsored this was uh, through the establishment of two Māori health research units uh, called Ngā Pūmanawa Hauora, one based in Palmerston North, the other in Wellington. And that, uh, for the past 20 years, has done a fairly uh, good job in terms of uh, identifying potential researchers, uh, providing young researchers with opportunities to participate on various studies, uh, allowing them to apply for uh, scholarships, and again, Carrie's point about, um, you know, sometimes at the end of the day, what uh, constrains a potential uh, isn't ability or intellect or passion, it, it's money. <laughs> How can you do a PhD when you've got other responsibilities? 
how can you study when you've got other responsibilities? Uh, so I think that's also an important uh, consideration. And again, we've been fortunate enough with our Health Research Council provides some fairly useful scholarships uh, to develop our researchers. Uh, this unit here provides mentoring, uh, negotiates relationships with key individuals, has a structured approach uh, to development, uh, which I guess I mean uh, sometimes, I don't know if people have felt this in the past, you sort of, for example, embark on a PhD, you've thrown into it, and there's no formal training around that. Uh, these units take a more deliberate approach to it, and providing career opportunities. Uh, what is the end point? Some of the current uh, challenges, second to last slide, identifying potential uh, researchers, that's difficult to do. Uh, often limited and fragile research opportunities, and I guess what I'm talking about there is if uh, you want to embark on a research uh, career, and Clive touched on this as well, oftentimes it depends on what type of external research funding you can secure, and it's not uh, always a career that's enticing to young people or young researchers when you say, well, you might be employed if we get this, and when this grant comes to an end, there may not be an opportunity for you subsequent to that. Retaining researchers is therefore a problem. Uh, locating good mentors, I was very, uh, and I'll keep them almost done. I was very uh, fortunate that I've only ever had one uh, mentor for the past 20 years who retired um, last year. And I don't want to, this, this isn't, again, this isn't provided, uh, this isn't based on any research or literature or discourse. But what I found in terms of a, uh, a mentor or a leader or a supervisor uh, and it, in, in terms of my mentor was that it it's, can be and it's quite often uh, senior indigenous researchers that have made their name, they've written all their papers and their fundamental interest isn't in themselves but in developing and nurturing others and that's certainly what I've uh, found uh, with my mentor. Uh, he, he didn't care about his reputation, already built his reputation. Wasn't, didn't care about papers. Uh, I remember uh, numerous times uh, he'd write a paper, get me to review it. I'd find where full stop was missing. Next minute my name would be on the paper <laughs> as a contributor. Not, uh, not anymore. <laughs> um, well, I think uh, mentors are, f are fundamental. And just a summary there of the points I made. I'm just going to do this again because I'm not very good with PowerPoint and this took me two days to get that to, to transition that way. <laughs> I'll give you a second look. Uh, but finally, having clear pathways, mentoring, uh, identifying researchers early, allowing them to participate, emerging researchers to participate in, in studies, having a deliberate and structured approach to training, um, having external support and a sympathetic environment. And Clive, that goes back to your earlier point too, about sometimes universities don't provide a sympathetic environment for our researchers. I've been there 20 years. <laughs> and it hasn't always been sympathetic. <laughs> Um, thank you for listening to me and I uh, just want to make a final point to really, uh, and others have made it to, I uh, found it uh, really inspiring so far to listen to the uh, views and perspectives of the previous speakers and uh, found myself constantly throughout the day nodding and not having to explain things because people here automatically uh, know what you're talking about. Greetings to you all. Kia ora. Uh, so you've probably got death by PowerPoint, <laughs> and I'm going to add to it, but I'd like to acknowledge the local traditional owners of this land and again express my gratitude for their welcome this morning. My cousin married someone from here, so I, think I was staggered when he said there were only 300 people belonging to this group, and I thought a privilege to be 
um, connected to them and this part of Australia. And welcome to all of you who have made me welcome whenever I've been in the countries which you come from. Um, I'm cheating. I gave this talk in October last year. I spoke to Sam and she says, gaps, priorities, you know, talk about whatever you want. And I thought, oh. Anyways, if anything's changed in, since October, there's a couple of things. So I will just try to skim through this. Um, Sam mentioned, um, and other people have mentioned the roadmap. There is a broad priority setting process for Aboriginal health and medical research in Australia, and it started 15 to 20 years ago. The first roadmap, roadmap one, was endorsed by council in 2002 and operated for a period. They're living documents. There's broad national consultation and um, roadmap two is available off the NHMRC web, web page. And I have to say communities have their own way of knowing. As a researcher, I know that communities, individual communities have their own way of sorting out what their priorities are. If you go to talk to them about a partnership and potential projects, there's a whole different process you go through where you know, there's an engagement and discussion about whether it's a local priority. Um, so moving on, this talk was um, actually given to the um, ASMR, Australian Society for Medical Research, very, very biomedical, and it was supposed to be a 10 minute talk. Um, I don't think this is the cut down version, so I will skim through. The question they asked me to answer in 10 minutes was what my views were on f approaches for undertaking Indigenous health research that will impact on the future health and economic challenges facing Indigenous Australians. So it's sort of the same question. Um, and you might think you shouldn't have relaxed yesterday, you should have changed your title page. But I think there's also <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that thing about um, self-care and mentoring and you know the way in which we, I guess this whole meetings about how we um, strengthen the supports for Aboriginal researchers in each of our different countries. So let me tell you what's changed since I gave this talk last uh, October last year and in the context of this meeting. I'm writing an editorial for um, a journal about Aboriginal children in Australia. So one of the things I'm thinking about currently is how much uh, we get colonised by that silver tsunami that was mentioned this morning. Um, it's ageing and health. We can ride that wave. We can talk about chronic disease. We can make that our mantra. But I've, I've been thinking, is it really our priority? Every time I open the newspaper, I'm reading about superannuation and how best to fit people to take care of themselves financially when they're older. I'm reading about the cost of pensions to Australia, society. I'm reading about the healthcare costs for people who live longer with, with chronic diseases that cost the taxpayer a lot of money. So there is like a tsunami of public policy based around ageing and health. But as I write this editorial for around Aboriginal children and their health, I think that's not really our issue. And the problem you all know don't need to tell you for minorities is you get caught up in the stream that carries you along around um, public policy. So in Australia, there's about 600,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. There's over 200 different language groups. Uh, this editorial focuses on zero to 14 year olds. 35% um, of our people are aged zero to 14. You know, they're the ones who in 20 years time will be in their early to mid adult years with chronic diseases. So when we, when we think about priorities, I don't think we should just list a bunch of chronic diseases, hypertension, diabetes, and so on. We should maintain that life course perspective on diseases. And we should, I, th I would encourage you, I actually did my PhD at an Institute for Child Health Research. So it's sort of part of my roots, my grounding in research, child health. But I would encourage you to think really 
are we riding that tsunami of ageing and healthcare? We can make that work for us because it helps us understand how to care for chronically ill middle-aged people in our communities. But let's not forget about that for Australia, 35% of Aboriginal people aged 0 to 14. How do we change some of the health, social, educational, economic outcomes for them with, with a, a framework um, for research that remembers them? So let me skim through this talk really because at the, if there's anything I want you to remember, it's that point. Um, and for that to be integrated into mentoring and research gaps, to not, um, to not have our research um, priorities colonised, our, you know, our direction, our goals. But then this is all fairly, this is just a picture of all the things that, um, uh, um, that I have been thinking about. The prize we've run, won for best res pu uh, research published in the Medical Journal of Australia is actually uh, last year was um, a RCT to try to improve our understanding of how to help Aboriginal women quit smoking in pregnancy. 60% of Aboriginal women smoke when pregnant, about 14 to 15% of other Australian women smoke during pregnancy. The whole issue of chronic stress. I've been reading papers that make me realise it's not just what my cholesterol is or my glucose tolerance or how whether I'm hypertensive or not. You know, Elizabeth Blackburn's the first Australian woman to win a Nobel Prize in medicine, and she's come up with all this stuff about stress, how it shortens your telomeres. It's related to um, to to ageing, chronic disease, and early mortality. And I thought. I was really pleased when I heard one of the young researchers this morning talk about her research program focused on working with um, stress reduction for Aboriginal people. Um, and because I think there's structural reasons for the stress that Aboriginal people live with, but there's also that that is really important to me. Um, so. Um, so I just mentioned four things, because you could, and these are my favourites, and you all have your favourites, you have different perspectives and disciplines that you've come from, but I think these are some of the, the things that will be important in Australia. Ensuring we have systems for optimal management of diabetes in pregnancy. More women are having babies at older ages, Aboriginal women included, although 20% of births of Aboriginal women are to teenagers. You more, more, and, and, and partly as a consequence of that, more women uh, have impaired glucose tolerance or gestational diabetes. Those offspring exposed to diabetes are more likely to be overweight, obese and diabetic. So that's like a, a key issue I think that I listed at this meeting last year, because uh, that's a problem here in Australia. Um, we have big social problems, very high juvenile imprisonment rates. I think whenever a juvenile, um, they ask me to speak about economics and you know, uh, as well as health. Whenever you send a juvenile to prison, you sort of really written off their chances of having a decent life and life expectancy and contributing economically to um, the societies in which we live. So developmental pathways, enhancing early educational performance and reducing risks for juvenile crime. Um, this, I don't know how you do it, like it's all about social determinants of health really, but continuing that march, uh, but also understanding uh, how stress has that impact on us. And uh, I guess cardiovascular disease is one of the major killers of Aboriginal people in Australia. Every developed country in the world over the last 30 to 40 years, we've seen death rates plummet from cardiovascular disease. And, it, and it's because of two things, partly because of prevention, less people getting the disease in the first place because there are lower rates of smoking, there's better cholesterol management, better um, hypertension management. But half of it is actually access to interventions, life-saving interventions, um, 
at so you know better access to those um, interventions. Um, this isn't the population pyramid. This is. Um, the age at which we die as Aboriginal people on this side and the age at which non-Indigenous Australians die. So, uh, so we've got to remember, even though there are not deaths amongst 10 to 14 year olds, there are all the early origins of these deaths in middle life. So um, in terms of our families, our communities, the things that we keep strong, the way in which we established systems to give these kids a better life, a better health, better life expectancy. I think that's a major priority and will be an area for focus for decades, I think. But um, um, trying to look down there. Uh, this, I think Noel touched on this. This is, if you have a bachelor's degree, if you have year 12, if you have year 10, by any measure, you're more education, you're better off in the labour force, employed full time. Your chances of any positive um, outcome are better with more better education. Um, these are imprisonment rates for Indigenous Australians and they are going up, um, not down, whereas the rates for non-Indigenous Australians have plateaued. And these are the difficult things that our communities live with and cope with on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think our discussion about research priorities have to include real things like this, as much as diabetes, as much as heart disease, as much as um, any of the medical issues we focus on, these basic um, um, but complex and difficult issues in our communities. Um, this was, um, I'm glad there are, I think the other gap is Aboriginal people in basic science. Elizabeth Blackburn, um, um, completed this work and it's really showing telomeres are the caps on the end of your chromosomes. I'm not a basic scientist but you know if your chromosomes are functioning well you're more disease free. Um, that, that's not. And she, she studied um, mothers of children with a chronic disease and compared them to mothers of children who didn't have a disability and these weren't Aboriginal people, these were um, but she showed the biological impact of living with chronic stress on both your telomere health or length and uh, amongst being shorter in people with high stress and uh, compared to people, mothers with low stress and um, your levels of telomerase which repairs and keeps your telomeres healthy being shorter, um, being lower in high stressed groups versus low stress groups. And I think, you're probably thinking, you're teaching us to suck eggs, we know stress kills you. But, you know, the, that, that two ways of viewing, understanding the biology of stress exposure as much as hypertension exposure, as much as, you know, impaired glucose tolerance, because they're societal level issues that, um, that affect people. Um, and it's not just the level of stress, it's how long you've been a carer. And you think of all the Aboriginal people with caregiving roles. So how long those mothers had been caring for their children with chronic disabilities. And it's not just how long you've been caring, it's your perceived level of stress. How many Aboriginal people and their perceived level of stress that they live with chronically. Um, that's important. So, and just knowing that stress is related to telomere shortenings, related to disease risk, and they're all related. So, we've we also have to integrate that into research priorities. Those structural issues that result in chronic stress, and I think it's really coming back to education and trying to. Um, 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 give people 
good early education because early good early education predicts your later education performance and that predicts re really your your opportunities across your life course to have more control over your day-to-day -day life um, and so the only other thing I want to I think I've mentioned all the things that I um, the, this is data on I don't on adults and children in Australia living with um, chronic stress toxic levels of stress 21 percent of 0 to 17 year old Aboriginals in the West Australian Aboriginal Child Health Survey had experienced 7 to 14 life stresses in the previous 14 months 12 months sorry um, and these are data on older Aboriginal people from a study of ageing and health in New South Wales and if the odds ratio is one your chances are equal of being in any of these categories um, this is physical disability functional limitations um, but you can see um, the more disabled categories Aboriginal people have a, you know at least two times more likely to be in these um, categories than non-Aboriginal people in terms of um, experiencing physical disability, having functional limitations in their day-to-day -day life, or being a carer for other people, even living with their disabilities and being carers for other people. Um, this was a review we did just of exposure to low birth weight or high birth weight, hyperglycemia or diabetes in pregnancy, and how that increased the odds of people getting cardiovascular disease as adults, renal disease, diabetes or impaired glucose tolerance. Um, and that it's th th that focus is important in Australia for us, for you as well, in terms of prevention of diabetes and obesity. Um, these are data on um, diabetes, gestational diabetes prevalence for 25-year-olds, these are national data and they're preliminary data from a PhD student. For every age group, you can see from 1980 up to 2010, the prevalence of diabetes, exposure to diabetes in pregnancy is going up, that it's higher the older you are as a mother. And so I was flagging this at that meeting as one of those priority areas for future research um, because that is something that's changing and that predicts diabetes and obesity in another generation. Um, I won't go through this but it basically shows you can um, have tight control of diabetes in pregnancy and get better outcomes at least as they're measured when babies are born. So. I won't go through the next part of it. The next, there's another whole study, but it just basically shows for the state of New South Wales that Aboriginal people are 37% less likely, you know that from other studies elsewhere, to receive a cardiovascular intervention after they're admitted to hospital with a um, heart attack. Um, and that even after adjusting for the hospital of admission, an Aboriginal person walking into the same hospital as a non-Aboriginal person is 18% less likely to get an um, intervention. Uh, part of that's related to Noel's point about good primary care because coexisting comorbidities um, is, is you know, one of the factors explaining that, but it is disappointing to see when that is linked so much to improved survival from heart attacks and cardiovascular disease. So when Sam rang me up, I just thought, priorities, Sam, there's just so many of them. You know, where do you start? I've touched on a couple of my favourites, but, um, and not favourites, but <laughs> um, some of the things that are, in my mind, um, and that I think are priorities across our different countries. Um, I do have to run off at five because you don't often get prizes for research projects and <laughs> the particular, I wasn't going to go and get it, but we took us nine years to write the grant and complete the study. So I thought, okay, I'll come for the first day of this meeting 
and I'll go back to Sydney to for that event tomorrow. It's been great to be in the room with you all. Um, you've reminded me of so many different things and the challenges are still there. So thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to uh, uh, thank the communities for welcoming us into your territory. Um, and, and of course, to the organizers for putting this um, workshop together, because I think it's really important. Uh, and hopefully Canada will be able to host the, the next one. That's the word that I hear. Um, so this is where I come from. I'm actually, uh, I was born in the prairies. and. Um, the province that you see here is Manitoba. The, the little square box in red is actually, this is where I grew up. The house that I grew up in was actually, you can't see it here because it, it burnt down when this picture was taken. But um, we lived in a Métis community around the south shore of Lake Manitoba. And um, I moved from there when I was 18 years old. And, and this might be hard to imagine, but we didn't actually have running water in our house even, even at that time. And so um, this, and this is a one hour drive approximately from Winnipeg, which is a, a, a fairly respectably sized city by Canadian standards. Some people would be surprised to hear that. So we had no running water. So um, I think from a young age, I probably developed some uh, reverence, I suppose, and respect uh, for, for, for the value of water. Um, and, I'll, and I'll come to that afterwards, but I just wanted to show you uh, some of my students. Uh, some people make fun of me and say that I have a United Nations group, and to some extent that's true. Um, I, I was very fortunate. Uh, this was a picture actually taken a few years ago, um, and I'll just maybe point these students out. Uh, this student, this student, and this student are all Aboriginal students. Um, the one in yellow actually was the first female um, graduate student to graduate from the Department of Chemistry at this university and so I'm she's my main claim for fame because uh, <laughs> there's not many of them um, and the other two students are both Métis one from Saskatchewan and one from uh, Manitoba and these two students were remarkable uh, they, they just did so, so much fantastic work the fellow that's sitting up on this block behind me actually was considered as a student at risk so I, I brought him on anyways, and uh, he actually was really phenomenal in the lab. And one day we were walking out of the building together, and I said, you know, Joel, um, I've really noticed that you're pretty good in the lab. You're really good with your hands. I said, you must have worked in the lab before. And he says, no, in fact, this is my, my first job. I said, so uh, why is that that you're so, you, you seem to be very good with your hands. He says, well, I work on my motorcycle and, and, the, and these kinds of things. and um, so it was it was great to have him in the lab, and you know, if if you did things based on on the book, I don't think I would have brought him into the group, but I did, and I'm forever thankful that I did because he really he really brought a lot of uh, good things with him. I wanted to tell you a little story um, of a young man I knew. This was back in 1992. Um, he went he he lived in Winnipeg. Um, Winnipeg is where I'm from, and uh, he was working on a four-year degree and he wanted to go on and do graduate work. So he went to the nearby university within the city, University of Manitoba, it's a little bit bigger. And he nervously made this appointment with this um, senior professor to talk about his admission to the, the department as a graduate student. And the, so the day came and, and they met and um, unfortunately the meeting didn't go so well and the professor that met up with him said, you know, I looked at your transcript and your record and he says, frankly, I don't think that you're ready to go to graduate school. Um, in fact, I, what I would recommend is that you take a couple of uh, maybe some, a years worth of courses or perhaps two years. And, but still, I don't think that you're going to be ready. Um, I recommend that you do something different. And so uh, this was a crushing uh, experience for this young man. And he, he left afterwards feeling pretty deflated and demoralized. And, but he actually went and talked to someone who he could confide in. I guess you would call him a mentor. And the mentor spoke to him and said, I can't believe that you, know, you were talked to that way, first of all, and I don't think that you should believe what you were told. So turn around and um, you know, apply to a bunch of other schools. 
And I can almost guarantee that once you do get accepted, uh, that university will want you back again. And that's your decision if you want to do that. So he did exactly what his mentor told him to do, and he applied to some other universities, and, and, and that young fellow got accepted at the University of Saskatchewan and uh, went on and did a PhD. And uh, th then after, he went and did a postdoc and became a professor. And uh, several years after becoming a professor, actually it was probably during his postdoc years, he ran into that professor from the University of Manitoba. And um, that professor knew that he had gone on and had succeeded and did quite well and actually couldn't look him in the eye. So they had a curriculum review here at the University of Saskatchewan. The person I'm talking about is me. Um, and uh, so this professor came and did a curriculum review and I came into the room to, to talk. And he knew me by first name and everything else, but uh, he, I think he quite frankly felt pretty embarrassed about this bad advice that he gave me a long time ago. But I have to thank him though, in spite of the fact I was feeling really rotten after this meeting. But I think what he taught me was that he taught me the kind of teacher or professor I don't want to become. And, and, I'll, and I'll always thank him for that because he taught me how to deal with people in a, in a more uh, humble way and uh, in an open way. So those of you that aren't familiar with Canada, um, I now live in Saskatchewan, so this is next door to Manitoba, and apparently they tell us this is the only rectangular shaped province, so it's right in the middle of the prairies. So we're square, I guess. <laughs> This is the University of Saskatchewan, and the building you see in the forefront here is actually our chemistry building. Um, th this was built about 100 years ago. So there's a lot of green, and it's uh, beautiful in the summer, and not, not as picturesque in the wintertime. So in Canada, we have three granting agencies that really cover um, different areas. We have one called NSERC, which is a natural science foundation. Basically, it supports uh, basic research in sciences and engineering. Then we have CIHR, which we're probably quite familiar with. And I just leave you the website there if you want to take a look. And there's four pillars of research that are often looked at. And you can see these. And thirdly, we have what is the SHRC, or the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. And the last um, organization here is probably where a lot of Aboriginals have been funded um, because of the direction and the demographics in Canada. There seems to be more people going into the natural sciences as well as health research, but by far and large, I would probably venture to say that SHRC is the major funder of Aboriginal related research. Although I'd have to acknowledge what Dr. Carone talked about this morning about, I did a quick calculation and it looks like it's about 3% of the, the budget of CIHR which works out to 3% of Aboriginal people in Canada. So in CIHR, we have these 13 institutes, and the first one I list here is the Aboriginal People's Health, um, which is really a flagship for Aboriginal health research in Canada, and this is really due to the, the work of Dr. Jeff Reading and um, Dr. Malcolm King currently, who's the scientific director. But you can see that there's these other institutes that have different priorities, but really the one that's really quite important, perhaps in the context of what we talk about today, is the first, Aboriginal people's health. So you can see that there's a diversity of various kinds of research that's going on in these different institutes. And I won't go on and, and say much about them, but um, the Aboriginal people's health is, is different, definitely important, and it's a flagship, I would have to say, of, of, of really the, even the three councils that we have in Canada. And ultimately, it's really to improve the health of Aboriginal people. Um, I won't say too much, but one of the uh, centers that's emerged from um, uh, the Ab Institute of Aboriginal People's Health is the NEAR centers, and these are quite interesting. Um, there's approximately nine in total, and they're sort of distributed across Canada. And they're really um, large groups of researchers um, w with significant training capacity for Aboriginal research and Aboriginal researchers, really training people from the undergraduate all the way to the, the postdoctoral fellowship level. And this has had, I think, a huge impact in terms of a, a model, if you will, in terms of mentorship. Perhaps this is one of the key points of the NEAR centers is that 
it's an interesting model which allows large groups of people to work together and to gather together at various times during the year. And this seems to be a theme of, of many of the things that we talked about today. Um, you can read through this, but uh, the, the last point here is probably important, and this provides an appropriate environment uh, and resources uh, to encourage Aboriginals and non-Aboriginals to pursue a career in Aboriginal health research. Um, this I taught an environmental chemistry class, and I thought I would show this because it's, 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 it's interesting and it relates to some of the, the models that we've seen today. I could show this as a, a medicine wheel if I wanted to, but I just thought I would take the exact figure from the textbook. But what it shows really is um, uh, the different environmental compartments, the atmosphere, water, the terrestrial environment, soils, and so on, and how all of these things are interconnected together. And um, there's a reason why I show this, because um, if you look at a slightly more complicated diagram, it really shows how you have the biosphere, the geosphere, and the hydrosphere, atmosphere, and how all these things are connected together through the mass transfer of various gases and water and so on, and ultimately how we sitting at the center can be effect, affected and affect those different compartments around us. Um, in terms of research, I think that this is an important area because um, there are where some areas where I see as, as gaps, and uh, I'll talk about that in a moment, but I also wanted to talk about some related things which have also been mentioned today, and these are some of the inequities uh, in health, but what I think, and, and, and this is something that uh, Dr. Barasa talked about earlier, is really the underrepresentation, particularly in sciences. I call them STEM fields, but this would be science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, and we really have a need to build capacity in these areas. Retention and attrition was talked about, uh, and this is a huge issue. I think even at University of Saskatchewan, uh, we have about a 50% um, attrition rate uh, after first year for Aboriginal students, which is really quite high, and I, I think actually unacceptable. Um, there's different kinds of research, as you know, um, and I look at uh, some of the, the different areas that have been targeted um, as almost reactionary in a way. Um, some of these reactionary or targeted research areas are due to problems, but I think there's also a need to probably look more and invest almost as much in exploratory research to address those problems before they become quite significant, and the environment is one such example. Because as you know, if you've been reading the news in Canada, um, many of the environmental programs are being chopped uh, really right down to nothing. It's certainly the monitoring programs, um, and Canada was considered as a leader in the world at one point, but I don't think really is anymore. Um, and this is because of our, well, our policies and so on for environmental research, which I think is in a, it's in a state of disarray. I, I think I'll leave it at that. Um, so I think that there's a need to connect environment and health a little bit more. This is currently being done, but perhaps maybe not at the level it, it should be. Um, and of course, men mentorship and how one addresses mentorship. Well, I'll maybe make some comments on that towards the end. So one issue that I think that's important, and I've raised this with uh, Dr. Malcolm King about a year ago, and I said, you know, Dr. King, I said, I think we really need to look at water in a serious way because this really addresses a lot of uh, health issues that have been largely overlooked. Um, here's an example of a report that came out about five years ago by the Polaris Institute, and they highlighted 10 communities, for, uh, several of which uh, were, had it considered to have a huge problem, like a, a, a state of emergency, if you will. Um, People, if you've been reading the news, you know, you've heard about North Battleford, Walkerton, and Kosheshwa, and these were uh, serious outbreaks, primarily microbial in nature, which affected water quality, and in some cases, numbers of people died. Um, but these other communities that you see here have various kinds of environmental problems, some of them microbial in nature and some of them chemical in nature. The chemical ones are not the ones that you often hear about. Fort Chippewa is a good example. Um, this is situated very close to the tar sands in Alberta. And so there's all kinds of uh, bile duct cancers that are sort of off the charts in terms of their incidence um, that can be related to either heavy metals or petroleum byproducts from the oil sands processing that takes place upstream of this community. Um, Yellow Quill First Nation um, in Saskatchewan 
suffered a huge problem, and that was really because of their source water. And I'll show that this, this was probably, if any of these communities, was a, a success story where local people and traditional knowledge and scientists worked together to fix this problem. So water, I think, is a huge issue, um, as many of you know. This is a, a sort of a typical system that you'd find in, in a city. In cities, we don't really worry about water quality because it's generally safe and the incidence of disease and outbreaks are very low. Um, but this is not true in remote communities uh, that don't have access to this kind of infrastructure. So this is the Yellow Quill First Nation. This was their source water that they were pumping into the plant. Uh, really terrible. Um, uh, bacterial counts that were off the charts but using um, a combination of both chemical and biological technology, they're able to clean up their water pretty substantially. And in, and in my estimation and understanding, this is probably the only real success story that's happened in Canada in terms of addressing water quality in a First Nation community within the last decade. Um, I was reading this book on the plane and the uh, stewardess leaned over and said, is that really true? that every drop is for sale. And I said, yeah, that's actually true. And every time you buy a bottle of water, you're making it more of a reality. And uh, so this privatization of water is, is real. And um, it's unfortunate, but th there's a lot of reasons behind that. And I, and I won't go into this too much, but this is uh, affecting a lot of Aboriginal communities as well, particularly in the north part of Canada, because uh, the Mackenzie Valley pipeline um, uh, is argued to transport oil and gas, but uh, you could also argue that it's also being built to transport water down these North American corridors. And that's going to be of greater value than the oil and gas that they currently have in the pipes. So part of the reason for the alarm, um, and I don't want to end on a sour note, but um, if, you, if you take a look, it took till 1800 really to reach a world stable population of a billion. And really, uh, <laughs> population expanded exponentially since 1800 and right now we're sitting at well a year or two ago we were at 7 billion and it's projected that the population will hit about 12 to 13 billion by 2050 so you know right now in the world that there's resource shortages food shortages and so on and so if we keep on our trajectory you can imagine that water shortages will certainly certainly be a problem and so um, still to this day, if you read the New York Times, you will see people um, dis debating whether or not climate change is real and so on. And this is, this is incredible. This is, I can't believe that people are still debating this. But there's an, it's, it can be really understood from a, an elementary school point of view. But often what people don't talk about is how does water implicate itself into this whole climate change thing? And so this top graph that you see, if you've ever watched Al Gore's movie, Inconvenient Truth, this is just showing the CO2 levels going up over the past century. And so what's interesting is that water acts like a, a, an amplifier. So when you get CO2 in the atmosphere, it causes warming, but then water uh, amplifies that effect. And that's something that climate change modelers actually don't look at too closely. And um, it's part of the reason why we've had this accelerated climate change that, that we've observed, which is beyond the, what the modelers had predicted. Um, the consequence of this is it's had devastating effects in Western Canada, British Columbia and Alberta, and it's also happening in Saskatchewan. So as the climate change is warmed up, the, um, the pine beetles have been able to overwinter and the, the, the kill rate hasn't been as high. And so you're seeing tracts of forests like this that are being completely wiped out by the pine beetle. And they're now out now in Saskatchewan. So they've migrated from BC and they're moving, they're moving east. Uh, this is having tremendous impacts on traditional activities and people that live in these communities. A few years ago, you may remember the, the BP oil spill, the Deep Horizon. And this was uh, captured in the news and uh, uh, it was a big boondoggle. But the company solution for addressing this was to put a dispersant and uh, basically take that oil and cause it to be submerged within the ocean. Um, so the problem wasn't addressed, but it, it, it was out of sight, out of mind. Um, and anyone who's got a, a rudimentary knowledge of science would realize that uh, this was a terrible, terrible decision just absolutely terrible, but very little was said about this in the news. So on an international basis, we have some real serious water problems. Um, 
Dead zones were, have been reported for some time. In the first decade of the 1900s, there was about a report of about three or four. They're actually shown by the black dots on this um, global map. And what they are is basically areas where rivers dump effluents as they pass through populated areas, could be pesticides, various kind of chemicals, and they dump their payload into the ocean. And what happens is it, it depletes the oxygen, kills the fish and plants, and it's really a, a dead zone. There's nothing that can live in there. And not, as of 2008, there was um, 405 of these, and they're growing, and it's, and it's really quite incredible. Two minutes, okay. Um, desalination technology, uh, if it wasn't for this, Australia would be running out of water. So it's big, it's important. It's really important to, to health, Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people. Too much water causes floods. This happens in Canada. This was the flood in Pakistan. I think 25 or 30 million people were displaced. You can imagine the, uh, the health effects after that flood moves out. Um, factory farms, there's lots of these in Canada. Government policies have promoted these places. You can't grow crops in these areas after the factory farms have moved in. Uh, the soil is too acidic and toxic. Oil sands in northern Alberta, the world's been watching. It's a crisis. It's an absolute crisis. But uh, there's a lot of deniers that say that this is not a crisis. It's affecting a lot of water quality and security. Food versus fuel, the biofuel plants in Brazil and South America and all over the world, making choices as to the diverting crops to uh, various other things, huge impacts on health, food security. This is a success story. Um, the Chilean people recognized that eucalyptus leaves could trap water. Um, so working with scientists, they developed a polymeric composite, built these nets so when the fog rolled over the mountains, the, w the water would precipitate out on these nets and would provide these communities with fresh water because what had happened before is they were relying on uh, trucks to be bringing this up to the top of the mountain, but the trucks were used to haul all kinds of chemicals. People were getting sick. And it was affecting their health. So this was a way that addressed uh, some of their issues. So there's indigenous uh, science going on here, how to disinfect water using the sun and some simple techniques. Um, uh, bulk transport of water, uh, it's, a, it's a huge problem. I won't go too much into this. Um, Canada as, uh, con was considered as conscience of the north. Uh, good environmental policies, but we actually don't have a national uh, drinking water policy. So you can have different quali water quality in each province, and there's a reason for this. Um, Aboriginal people have really been uh, put in a, uh, a serious predicament because of the way and the access that they have to fresh water. Um, I won't talk too much about our work, but what we've been doing is really designing materials for cleaning water, um, using different kinds of polymers. Um, and just, just by way of conclusion, I guess I would just say that um, there's a lot of health issues, as you know, uh, and inequities, and there's a real need to build capacity. And one of my points, I guess I would like to say, is we really need to build capacity in, in these STEM areas, because ultimately that will build a good, strong pipeline for people in health research. And I don't think that that's really being encouraged uh, enough. Um, and I think another thing is that it's been really humble to be in this room, and um, I think there's a need for us to celebrate and profile our mentors, because I think a lot of young people that are coming into the system don't really know. And um, uh, I can talk about some projects that people have been working on in this regard, but this is really important because I don't promote myself, um, and I don't think a lot of you guys promote yourself either, but this would be important for young people and a real simple solution to encourage people. Um, I think that um, you know we, there's opportunities for us to work together as scientists and health practitioners and researchers with um, people in communities, and, and it's good to see that that's being done. We probably need to new, do more of that. Um, and I also think that uh, we need to reevaluate the value of the environment. And I was pretty happy to see that um, Cheryl Smith talked about this a little bit in, in some of their priorities. Um, the European Declaration has uh, recognized water in a very ethical sense and, and created a new framework. And actually Robert Sanford wrote an interesting book on this, but a lot of the, 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 the framework around which this is built is built on Aboriginal belief systems. 
and uh, this is a really uh, important area and it's really turning the whole um, way that we look at water policy upside down and so I'll just stop there and